Let's get the inside scoop today on learning and success from a unique and exciting guest right here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's free weekly e-newsletter, Unleashing Your Remarkable Potential, which is full of articles and resources to help you become a more confident and successful leader. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash newsletter. And now here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. You are going to be excited about this guest. If you're watching, you can see him and you might recognize him. But if you're not watching or you don't know, I'm going to tell you who we're, we've got today. We Today we have with us DC Glenn. He is a platinum selling rapper, an actor, a voiceover professional, as well as a fashion photographer and motivational speaker. He is featured in one of my favorite commercials and the number one commercial in the country right now. Geico's scoop. There it is. Uh, commercial. DC Glenn, welcome. Glad to have you. Hey, man. Glad to be here. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I, I am excited to have you here. And, and so I think the best place for us to start is where I start with a lot of guests. And that's sort of like, tell us about your journey. You, you certainly didn't wake up when you were 10 and say, I'm going to be on television commercials. But I did wake up in Chicago, Illinois one morning, you know, 55 years, 54 years ago. And when I was, four, you know, born in Chicago, uh, moved to Denver, Colorado when I was four years old. When I moved to Denver, Colorado, had a great childhood. Uh, me and Steve Rowland, the other half of tag team, met in high school, right? And that was the beginning of my evolution. From that point, Steve had a band they used to play in the quad. I had to be in that band. And then I worked at the Tardy office and the choir um, room was down the hall and I heard beautiful music. I had to be in the choir. And then Steve's friends DJed our first high school party. And I saw people using two turntables and a microphone. And I was like, I got to have that. And that progression started me on my way to being a multi-platinum artist um, my entire career and having one of the biggest songs in the history of court music. Whoop! There it is. And yeah. So, so uh, okay. So, um, uh, people talk about you've heard this a hundred times. People talk about the overnight success story kind of thing, and you have a big hit like that, and they're like, "Wow!" And this guy's here. Here they are. Here's here's DC and Steve. But the question I would ask is like, how long did what was what happened? Uh, how long did it take to get from where you just started till you had the massive hit record? The first thing I need to tell everybody, there is no overnight success. That's I knew I that's where you were headed. That's why I framed it that way, right? I started DJing when I was 15 and I made Wound There It Is when I was 24. So it took a while. But we had a band. We played everywhere. Then, you know, as young men, we grew apart. I went to school, uh, college at Sac State University. And I kept up with the music. I started, me and Steve stayed together and we started rapping. We started making songs and started making beats and learned how to do it. Then I was a DJ. I DJed all the fraternity parties. So my music continued, right? And I came, he came down to the Art Institute to get his education in music. And I followed soon behind because I had a good time when I came down to Atlanta and visited him. And I actually had a job at CNN, but... I went to a club called Magic City and the DJ was having a bad night. And I was like, wait a minute, I could do this. And when asked the owner, did he need a DJ? And he's like, no, nah, I don't need a DJ, but come see me Monday. And I went and seen him that Monday and he was like, I don't need a DJ, but I need a cook. And I was like, yeah, I can cook. And you'd be the cook and you'd be the backup DJ. And I, you know, I made two salads, cooked one order of chicken wings. Then the day shift DJ was like, hey man, can you, can you cover for me for a little while? And he let me, you know, he let me run his business and I ended up taking his business because once I got on the ones and twos, it was over. The girls all loved me. They chose me. They picked me. Now, this is an adult entertainment club, which I didn't tell everybody, but I got to let you know that because it is key in my development because now I'm in a club. I'm the number one DJ. I'm the head DJ. I get to play my own records and get to test them. 
And we were in the Southeast and I knew we had to make bass music. And I told Steve, we got to make up-tempo music if we're ever going to be rock stars, dude. And he was like, I can't do that stuff. And he was like, you can't. Just think this. Because we're hip hop, but we're in a new region, a new form of music. And when you're in Rome, you got to be like the Romans, but you can still do it your way. And we did it our way. And everybody thinks that Woomp There It Is is this big Manhattan project, rocket science project with whiteboards and geometry and trigonometry and physics. And it's just a party song about two guys having a ball on a Friday night. That's it. It's just a song. And because of my hubris, I play it at the club. And it's, to this day, it's the biggest response on any record I've ever had. But I think every record I have as a young man with hubris problems thinks that every record he does is a big record. So I shelve it for a while, then I bring it back. And one of the record company reps heard it one night and he was like, what is that? And I was like, that's my song, well, there it is. He was like, I'm gonna send that to New York. Columbia Records calls me. Now all the labels are calling me. Hey okay, man, so okay, time out. So time, so time, time out. And I've got to let you, but, but um, um, you, you've, been doing been this, doing you guys recorded, 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 a record company rep named Lisa McCall worked at Mercury Records, told me to call Al Bell. Al Bell used to own Stax Records. If you don't know what Stax Records is, at the beginning of soul music, um, there were three record companies, Motown, Philly International, and Stax Records was Al Bell owned. The year before, he had put out a record by a bass group called uh, Deuce. The name of the song was Daisy Dukes. It went gold. I was like, yes, that might be the guy that can work it. I called him. He didn't call me for a week and a half. I actually forgot. But then he called me. I was like, oh, Mr. Bell, I have a hit record. Everybody loves it. It's the greatest thing since anything. And I'm so passionate. And I just basically just yelled at him. I think, you got to sign us. <laughs> right. And he was like, OK. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. You haven't even heard the record. And to this day, I'll never forget these words. He said, brother. I don't have to hear the record. I hear it in your spirit. Let's agree to agree and get this thing going. I was like, wow. And then I gave my two weeks at Magic City, the club I was at, signed a messed up record deal. And in a month and a half, we were platinum. Month and a half. So how did that, how did that change your life? Just got busy because I knew what was going to happen. I knew what was going to happen. I knew that I was never a starstruck person because I was always a DJ. So I'm always in, I was already popular. I knew, I already knew everybody. It was more of, I watched what happened when others acted like stars because you're only going to be hot for so long. And when you fall, if, you know, you get hot, you go to the club, you treat everybody like crap. You think you're everything. And then those people don't like you. And then when you fall, because everybody does, everybody fades in different you know, degrees. Mm -hmm. And those people revel in your demise and a lot of artists never come back. And I vowed never to be that person. And my father probably gave me the best advice once we, you know, during that time. He said, son, he said, this is gonna end, I'm proud of you. He said, like when I went to school, you know, all my friends had the Cadillacs and the beautiful women and all this, but I stayed in school, I went to college, I got my doctor's degree. Now I have all the Cadillacs and they are all broke. And I tell you this because I do not want you to chase it because if you chase it, it will destroy you. Chasing that ghost of fame, right? And I, I remembered that. So I, I vowed that I would never be that way. I stayed the same. We don't act like stars. We go into a place, we do what we gotta do and then we leave. It wasn't about that for us. It was about the music. and. Then we started having adversity because the record company went bankrupt. And I'm like, well, wait, where's, where's all the money? And so I tried to sue the record company and me suing the record company thinking I have long money, didn't realize that the record company has long money. They went bankrupt. 
then it was over. But then another record company bought it out of bankruptcy, and then a battle ensued between those two record companies, and we're caught in the middle. So that stymied my career, and now I'm stuck. But I'm a grown man. I take responsibility for everything that I do. And I could have cried over spilt milk, but I didn't. I basically became a paralegal. I said, I know I'm going to have my day in court. And I adapted. (laughs) And I said, I'm going to organize all this legal stuff. I'm going to organize all this discovery, all these cases, put all this stuff together. And this was kind of part of my, my, my venture into creating tactics that helped me learn how to learn, right? You create tactics to get through things. And that was one. It was like, I could have been mad. I could have been this. I could have been that. But I said, no, take that negative energy and turn it into something positive. So I did that. And then I continued on. I became a licensed commodities broker. I said, okay, I never want this to happen again where somebody messes with my money. So I took the Series 3 test, passed it. Then I was like, hey, I want to have me a hedge fund. I don't know nothing about a hedge fund. So I said, hmm, let me call a hedge fund manager and see what they know. So this is when I act like a star. Hey, how you doing? My name is DC Glenn. DC is the Brain Supreme Tag Team. You might know the song. Boom, there it is. You're lying. No, really? Yeah, I'm trying to put together a hedge fund. I've got Deion Sanders. I've got uh, uh, Dominique Wilkins. I've got all the stars. And I just wanted to kind of put together a meeting suit with you guys to see what we could do. Sure. So now I got a meeting in New York, Vegas, LA, uh, San Francisco with hedge fund managers. I know nothing about a hedge fund. So I go to Vegas. I'm in the boardroom. They're telling me all their whoop there it is stories. Then we get down to brass tacks. They start telling me, DC, we want to do this, this, that, and that. We can do this for your money. We can control the money like this. And then you're going to get returned. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, well, still, why should I? Okay. And what they didn't realize, and this is my learn how to learn technique, what they didn't realize while they were pitching me they're teaching me yeah right and that was the first time i did that and have served me so well then you know i just think differently like i had a lot of friends who always when we were in high school they'd be like i can't get a job i was like yeah you can no i can't i drove around all day i was like that's not how you get a job i said this is how you get a job go get the phone book where you want to do where you want to work you want to work at a restaurant cool you start calling all the restaurants in your area so are you uh, accepting applications? No. Are you hiring? No. Uh, are you accepting applications? Yeah. Really? Are you hiring? Yes, a girl just quit. Okay. You can come today. You got a job. Now, it took me three minutes to do that where it would have took all day and I might have hit three places, right? And every time I did that for people, they got jobs. Learn how to learn. It's just a different approach. And I learned about a hedge fund, but I realized it wasn't for me, right? So I could, but... You know, you drop a bomb, there's collateral damage. But when you do things and you don't necessarily, they don't pan out, it's not collateral damage. I call it collateral sprinkles. There are good things that come of it. And one of the things that came of it, 2000, I would watch CNBC, didn't know anything. I couldn't even understand what they were saying. 2002, I know everything they're saying, right? And I know that now it's up to me to get my own money because... I'm sitting in a movie theater and I'm watching Will Ferrell stand on a table, dancing to my song in Elf. (laughs) And I realized that Woomp There It Is is now evergreen. And I know now that I can't depend on anybody to make the money for me, but me. And meanwhile, I had to go back to DJing. And you asked me at the beginning, what book were you reading? But I remember one book. You know, I did the Anthony Robbins, Robert T. Kiyosaki. I did all that. That was in the 2000s. That's when everybody was just doing the whole self-help thing. But there was one book I cannot remember, but I remember the story about a guy who wanted to start a pot shop. He, he started as a busboy, and he came up, learned how to make pies. Then he quit, opened his own pie shop. Then he franchised it. Then he sold it for $20 million. And he called his, his um, technique getting in the corridor, right? And that's why I was kind of was doing anything, but it, it solidified and narrowed my focus because I was more than just a DJ. I'm your sound guy. I am your light tech. I'm doing your flyers. I'm doing your fashion photography. I'm doing your posters. I'm doing your television ads. I'm doing your voiceover. I'm doing your radio ads. 
And now I mean, I put together a business plan because I wanted to learn how to make a business plan being in the corridor. I thought it was just writing down, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. A business plan is hard, but I did it. It took me six months to put together a business plan. I came with the numbers. I bought me a screen and a projector and sat in my boss's office and gave them a PowerPoint presentation on how I could increase their bottom line. And she cut me a check for $25,000 and said, get started. And now I am invaluable. You right. have to make yourself invaluable. If you're stuck in a dead end job, you're stuck because you're in a dead end job. You have to make yourself invaluable. If you make yourself invaluable, that's how you move up. So that means you got to do way more than what you're supposed to. Yeah, you, you can't you can't say, well, I'm doing my job and expect to get no, 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 promoted. No, no, no. That's how it works. You got to do so much more that yeah. it doesn't. Everybody's looking at you like you're stupid, but if you know that. No, I'm not, because even if I don't get a promotion, I'm learning. Yeah. You know, because everybody, when I was younger, they was like, DC, why, why are you all over the place? You're this, you're this. Why are you doing that? And I'm like, because I got hustles. I'm a hustler. That's what I do. I'm hustling in a different arena because people are looking at me because they know I'm a hustler. So they're going to try to steal my hustle. So I'm like, you don't have to steal my hustle. I'll give you this hustle. And they're like, huh? It's like, yeah, because while you stealing my hustle, I got eight in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm exactly. next next man up. Let's go. So you can have that hustle and now catch me if you can. So now I, you know, they always people always tell me, smart people, DC, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And I'm like, yeah. But I can tell you if you live long enough and you work hard enough, all that becomes one. Right. All those things, all those hustles become one and they all serve you in different ways. And now you become masterful in some of those trades. Yeah. And that's all you can hope for. All you can do is be prepared for opportunities that come to you, right? So this all works together and I'm in the club and I said, well, 2011 rolls around and I get a call from a New York Times reporter, DC. Did you, did you did you hear the Gawker article? I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, Gawker wrote an article that Barack Obama was in your video. And I'm like, okay, how did you find me? She's like, it was very hard, my friend. <laughs> and the whole world blew up because they thought Barack Obama was in our video. Stephen Colbert, Jeannie Most was seen in. We did press that whole week. But it upset me because I was not in a position to... Get it in, you know, gain fruit off of to that. capitalize on that, I capitalize on that, right? And it was because I couldn't be found. That's when I realized, wait a minute, you're never going to make money if you can't be found. That's why you're only doing five shows a year. Now, they're lucrative shows because they're NBA halftime shows, and that's good enough. But, and we get a royalty check, but you could be on tours if people knew where to find you. So, that's what started my SEO career. And because I was doing all the marketing for the clubs, I wanted to get better at voiceover. I wanted to get better at video editing. I wanted to get better at SEO, website design, and all these things. And then I become masterful at them. Right now, I'm really a force to be reckoned with because now I'm a one-man band in the true sense of it, right? Yep. And I, 2015, I said, you know what? I can't be a 50-year-old DJ. <laughs> I just can't. And I started, you know, 2008 with voiceover. It was hard, right? And I, But I didn't quit. And here come the lawsuit now, and they both get their day in court. The old record company prevails. And then, you know, 2012 starts a series of appeals. And then the last appeal was 2015 to the Supreme Court. Can you imagine? Tonight on the From news. a song that came out in 1993, uh, yeah. yeah. right? Supreme Court takes on tag teams. Boom, there it is. And, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. But they, they, they were like, no, nah, we're not doing that. And... Now we prevail. And and it, it, it's all in shambles because it's in bankruptcy court. Now I got to fight, right? Because now my royalties that I've been getting all my life are at stake. The stakes are high. But because I didn't give up and I became my own paralegal, I found some lawyers, real good lawyer, Melinda, gave her a big box of discovery files and everything. Probably cost my, probably saved myself half the cost of them having to do research. And they came up with several scenarios for us to win. And we prevailed, we came out, but you know, at any war, you come out losing a leg, losing an arm, you know, 
eye patch, <laughs> right? Yep, little post traumatic yep. stress disorder. And then, you know, in 2000, August of 2017, it just all came to a head and I just got depressed and laid in the bed for a month. And I was just like, what am I going to do? 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 And I need probably needed that time. And I got a call DC from a company, DC. We heard your voice. We want to give you $10,000 for a voiceover. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And I did that job. I was already working little knickknack jobs, work for Apple Radio. I never gave it up on voiceover and I was training in Atlanta. And my coach was like, go to the People Store Agency, which is the biggest agency in the Southeast. And they're looking for African-American talent. I signed with them and now I'm cooking. I'm getting auditions every day. And then I book, I have a meeting with them up there and the owner comes in and she's like, I love your face, put him on camera. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, you're an actor now. So I'm like, what I got to do? I got to go to class and I got to go and I got to get headshots. So went to my first couple class and I never looked back. I was in class every day, sometimes two, three times a day. I went to every weekend intensive, flew to New York, LA. I found everything I could do to get up to speed in acting. It was the most difficult thing I ever had to do. And then all of a sudden, 2020, I booked my first national commercial for Pizza Hut. And I'm happy. Everything's good. I'm getting ready to prepare. And then all of a sudden, the pandemic happens. But I wasn't upset that I'd lost the money. I, was, I wasn't upset at anything because I had booked the culmination of all that hard work of a lifetime's hard work had came into me getting a national Pizza Hut commercial. But then, as everybody, we all had to stop at the same time. And right, the pandemic right. was probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in my life because it forced me to stop. Sometimes we think we're hustling, but, you know, we're sitting in the car revving the engine and we think we're driving, but we look outside, we're not going anywhere because we are stuck in mud and our wheels are spinning, right? And I went back to 2017. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And it goes back to voiceover. And because I didn't quit, because I kept grinding, now I'm doing COVID commercials. We're all in this together. COVID, right? I'm doing stuff like that because that's how every commercial was, right? Next thing you know, one of my acting coaches in LA calls me and says, hey, DC, I got a part for you in this movie. I'm casting. Can you get to Nebraska? Yes, I can, ma'am. Now I'm shooting my first movie in a cornfield in Nebraska. Happy as a clam. Two months later, I shoot my second movie in Georgia. Then I shoot a public commercial for voiceover. Then I book a Tyler Perry gig. Then I book Geico. That comes, that's the coup de gras. And the reason that happened, my agent, the people story to see Atlanta, Georgia calls me, says, DC, you just booked a Geico commercial. I'm like, don't play with me. I ain't even auditioned for a Geico commercial. Yeah, you did. You wrote a song. You, you wrote a song. But exactly, but, but. I'm thinking acting, but she's like, no, they said they want a tag team. I was like, oh, I forgot about that because <laughs> I'm so into acting and voiceover. That's my career now. And we're still doing shows, but that's my career now. And now I was like, wait a minute. Let me go back. I went and checked my tag team phone. I got the call from Geico because they went to the website that I didn't have before when the Gawker lady called, when the New York Times lady called. And now I... They called my, they, 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 they didn't get me, but they went to the internet, found me on IMDB because I played good breadcrumbs and fill out all my profiles correctly where people can find me like LinkedIn and all that's where social media is most important because people can find you not because look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And I let my agent make the deal. And it is the biggest, most lucrative deal I've ever made in my life. And it has done open up doors for me you know, that I could have never imagined because 10 years ago, you type in tag team, it was all wrestling. You type mm -hmm. in tag team today, it's all tag team. It's all, it's tag, all tag team. team. So I've got so a I've kind of, got a, I love, I love, love, the, I love the I love story. story. I, love I love the, the messages. messages. There's a couple of things that uh, yeah, I, I, I want to reflect on and then a couple other questions I want to ask you. So sure. as I listen to what you said, um, the two lasting things I'm going to take DC from our conversation, other than just the chance to interact with you is learning how to learn. Yep. But before you said that, you said that one several times, but the other thing yeah. I want to is connected 
that you didn't actually say, but is woven through the story from age 15 to where we just stopped, which is the value of preparation. Yes. So, so what would you say, or what would you add for people listening who are either leaders already and they're thinking about how do they prepare for their career or how they help their folks prepare, right. Or to stay on that path. What would you say about preparation? I got, I got the, yeah, that's the perfect question that lets me continue on where I left off. Everybody asked me, Hey man, I know you're happy. You got a guy go commercial. I was like, I was happy for two days. Then I knew I had preparation, right. And because I'm an actor, I'm prepared, right? And I knew that, I knew what I had. I had a Geico commercial. I had an opportunity. I had an opportunity to be great again. If I had just showed up, it would have been a commercial, but it wouldn't have been what it is now because I prepared for that commercial a month. I said, I want to go on this thing with five or six things that I can go to the director with. And he put he implements them. One was the spinning scoop. One was the sprinkles. I know kids love sprinkles. I don't know why they do. But sprinkles was important because I wanted everybody to see this as a tag team party. And kids would see it and look at their mother and say, I want a party like that. And I guarantee you this summer, every party that anybody throws for their children is going to be an ice cream party, right? Because that's what I wanted to bring. That's what it was for me as a child when my father used to make ice cream for us. And he would have the eggs and the vanilla and the sugar. And then put it in the cylinder. And he's like, all right, get busy. We'd have to put the ice in the wood bucket around it. Then we had to turn for five minutes. My brother had to turn for five minutes. Then 20 minutes later, two kids are eating ice cream. That's the essence I wanted to bring to the commercial. And I did all this preparation for a month. And when we had our pre-production meeting, I couldn't find anybody to make the spin and scoop. So I went, you know, I said, hey, can we, I got some ideas. He's like, DC, whatever you want to do. And we did all of it. And he, I'll never forget this. I was like, I tried to get a spin and scoop, but nobody can make it. He was like, it'll be done tomorrow. It's like, word, all right. And because I prepared, I had to spin the scoop. We got the sprinkles. The best sprinkles! The uh, best parts and the nuances in that commercial were because of preparation. And now that commercial in the end will go down as one of the best commercials that have ever, you know, that's one of the top commercials, right? It's the top commercial this year, at least, right? One of the top commercials this year, at least, but it will be go down as a very memorable commercial, right? That's part of the preparation. We had fun that day. It was beautiful. But I know that I got an obstacle in front of me because this is a Geico commercial. I could be happy I got a Geico commercial, but no, because when Salt and Pepper did theirs 2014, they were able to tour till the pandemic. I'm not going to I mean, yeah, I'm not going to be able to tour because of the pandemic. Right. But that doesn't stop me. I'm not sitting back like, well, I just, I'm just i just going to be happy. I was like, no. I'm going to take these lemons, make me a lemonade company. I'm going to franchise it. And I'm going to sell it for $20 billion. That is my mindset. So what can I do? Go get a publicist. You can blow up the rest of you. Blow up the acting. Blow up the voiceover. I go to a publicist because the pandemic, they haven't been able to shift on the paradigm. They don't know how to do something that I need to do. They like either they don't want to take my money, they don't think that they could do it, they don't care about it, whatever. I said, okay, thank you. And here is another learn how to learn moment. And it goes to the deepest depths of preparation. Whenever I get stuck, I join an organization, an association, or a society. Organizations are filled with professionals of a certain profession. And those professionals have been doing this 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And that's what their organization exists for, to make their profession bigger and better. Yep. So therefore, you pay that little $125, and you join that organization, and you can learn everything about that organization in possibly two weeks. I joined the uh, Public Relations Society of America. I want to know how to be a publicist. I get on a Zoom call two days in. Big CEO of this PR firm is the guest. I raised my hand. Our press release is relevant because I do all my due diligence. I knew I was going to have a press release. I knew I was going to drop it. I knew I was going to do all the things you need to do to get yourself out there. And I, I knew what I was doing. Our press release is relevant. Well, what's it for? Well, I'm kind of featured in this national Geico commercial called Scoop. There it is. And I'm looking at the chat. They're like, wait a minute. No, that can't be. Oh, my God, it is him. I love that commercial. Great commercial. You're the best. I love tag team. The Zoom blew up. The moderator's eyes are getting big. 
She's like, I love that commercial. DC, we're going to, we want to welcome DC to the organization. Glad you joined up. We're going to talk about that Geico commercial afterward, DC. But back to the question, our press release is relevant. CEO goes, yes, because think about it. The whole last year has been COVID. Yep. The whole, every story is COVID. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's mad. Everybody's upset. Everybody's just tired. And here you guys come with a feel good story and you're throwing sprinkles everywhere and spinning scoops and dancing and having everybody go back to their, to the nineties, thinking that they can dance when they can't <laughs> throwing out hips and everything. And it's the perfect story. Drop that press release. And you want to go here to get in front of all the journalists. You want to go here to get in front of all the podcasts. You want to go here to get in front of the TV talk shows. You want to go here to do this. You want to make sure your pitches are this, 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 this. She gave me an entire game in 10 minutes, all because I didn't quit. I played offense. I learned how to learn. And I haven't looked back. And it has opened doors for me that I could have never imagined. And... It is the reason you and I are here talking to. Well, that's exactly right. I was I was going to say that, right? So I, I've got uh, two last things. Um, yeah. One is, um, what do you do for fun? What I do. I I've had done a feeling, everything. I had a feeling stuff. that was going to be your answer. I, I, this is, hey, man, me doing this is fun. I'm having fun right now because... Mm -hmm. You blessed me with an opportunity to sit here and talk. Now I'm talking, but I'm not, I'm killing 14 birds with one stone. I'm practicing articulation for voiceover. I'm practicing storytelling to tell a good story, to be more, you know, to be, to have an impact. I'm getting to hash out all my tactics. I'm getting to see what people respond to, what people don't respond to. And then I get to spread it and keep telling people. And then I get to touch the world with sprinkles. Here you Please. go. I'm having fun doing everything I want to do, man, right now. That is, that's awesome. So where, if people want, I, I want to, you're, we're opening the door. We're in the corridor. We don't know who's going to be watching or listening to this. Where can, where do you want to point people? Where do you want, what do you want to tell people? If they want to find you now, where do you want to point them? See, this is the learn how to learn. Because I learned SEO, there are breadcrumbs all over the place. All you got to do is type in DC Glenn tag team. Whoop, there it is. And you will find me. That is a fact. Here. Right. It's that simple. And, you know, my last thing I want to say to people is there is no quit pro quo. Right. You don't plant a seed and look at the seeds. You sit down, cross your legs, grow seed. Come on, seed. Grow. Please grow seed. Seed, grow. This seed don't work. I quit. No, don't work that way. But you know people who think that way right? Instant gratification. No, you plant them seeds, you keep it moving. And I have planted so many seeds that I forgot about, right? That now I'm standing in a forest of opportunity that I could have never imagined. And my whole mind shift has changed. My whole mindset has changed because the pandemic taught me, wait a minute, there are no missed opportunities. There are no mistakes. You're, you, you thought it was a mistake that you you didn't act. You thought it was a mistake that or missed opportunity. You couldn't do voiceover. You're doing all that now. And what I realized, I do not, I do not want to leave this earth regretting I didn't do something. So now I learn. I've got tutors for music production, all the things that I've ever once learned, all my dreams. And I learn about them. I join organizations, learn everything I need to learn so I don't leave this earth. And I leave everything on the table, everything on the field. And that's my advice to everybody out there. Never quit until you're not breathing. All right, everybody, before we wrap up, a final question I have for all of you who are watching or listening. And that's the question I ask you every single week. And that's now what? What are you going to do with this? Are you going to take action? What, what do you need to do to prepare? What do you need to learn? What do you, how were you inspired by this conversation? Perhaps the question is, how do you play offense? Something that DC said just at the end. But if you just, if you take this as entertainment, that's one thing. But if you take it as opportunity, it's only really an opportunity if you take some action. And I'm pretty confident Mr. DC would agree with me on that. Um, DC, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, I, I'm probably going to be cooler in the minds of my children now uh, because we chatted and um, and uh, just say it. Uh, and um, so it was, it was truly a pleasure. It was, it was great to have you. And I want to thank all of you 
for being with us in a very special, unique, and different episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're glad that you were here. And as always, I'll be back next week. We'll see you all then. Thanks, everybody. Sprinkles! <laughs>